from? United States. United States. Washington through Seoul last night. Okay. Yeah, which, which which uh United Way Worldwide, biggest NGO in the world. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this very special 20th anniversary meeting of the World Economic Forum on East Asia. We will have an official opening session after luncheon, but this is the first um, plenary session. I welcome our members. I welcome particularly our Indonesian friends. Um, the World Economic Forum has been able to integrate the Indonesian political and business community quite substantially during the last year. So thank you uh, for this um, confidence you are giving uh, to our organization. And we start with a extremely exciting session. We talk about disruptions. And we have here a panel which um, also expresses in a very good way what the World Economic Forum stands about because we have in the panel politicians, we have business leaders, we have uh, civil society, and we have academia. So I may uh, just uh, present to you um, the different members of the panels, uh, and I do it in as it is a tradition in the forum, in alphabetical order, not according to uh, <laughs> protocol. <laughs> and first, um, Dominic Barton, uh, the worldwide managing director of McKinsey and Company. Brian Gallagher, who is president and CEO of United Way Worldwide, which is the biggest charity organization in the world. I think many companies would envy you if we measure you in terms of, um, uh, um, let's say, I don't, I, I want to avoid the word revenues, but. Well, we call it revenue. Yeah, you're, you're five, you are a five billion organization. That's right, five billion a US a year. A five billion organization. Uh, Kishore Mamubani, the dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of uh, Public Policy. Um, we know. Um, uh, you are from um, your exciting editorials and many other um, ways how you express your points of view. Then Nishihada-san, who is the chairman of the board of Toshiba Corporation. But, yeah, yeah, Nishida, Nishida, Nishida I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, I think you are not only a prominent uh, leader of one of the top companies, but you are also a vice chair of the famous uh, Keidan Ren organization in Japan. And then, of course, we have um, Minister Bangestu, the so Minister of Trade of Indonesia. I would say one of those personalities from Indonesia who is really worldwide known. And um, finally, and I should have said, from a protocol point of view, I should have mentioned you first, <laughs> Prime Minister. Um, Prime Minister uh, Sukhata from uh, Mongolia. Very happy to have you here. So we will we'll have a very lively discussion. And we speak about disruptions, managing global disruptions, managing Asian disruptions, let me ask the first question. What disruption on a global level become later to the regional level you are most afraid of? I want to have a very short answer, and then we will look how we can respond to this uh, global disruption. Kishore, why don't you start? OK. <laughs> what I'll try to do, Klaus, eh, is as you know, since many Asians are very polite, and often don't say what's on their minds. So I'll try to be a very rude Asian <laughs> and tell you what I think is in many, many Asian minds. And I can tell you the number one concern, to put it very rudely of Asians today, is what I call the incompetence of the West. <laughs> and this, I must tell you, is a huge culture shock 
I mean, especially in a place like Indonesia, where 10 years ago, you know, American policymakers, European policymakers, used to come here and give advice to Asians, and this is how you solve a financial crisis, swallow the bitter medicine, let failing banks go, this is how you fix a crisis. And then 10 years later, the same crisis hits America and Europe, and guess what? They cannot accept the same bitter medicine that they gave to Asians, and they continue to drift. <clears throat> And I can tell you, it's a, complete, it's a complete sense of bewilderment in this region on how the United States can be engaged in this amazing political gridlock when they have some fundamental economic challenges that they face. And how the Eurozone can't get its act together, so much so that we worry week after week, what's going to happen to it? What happened to Western competence? And that's my number one worry. Minister, what is your biggest global worry? Uh, I think uh, as a trade minister, because this is, uh, if you like, my daily bread, pardon the, the pun, uh, is food security uh, issue. Uh, we went through 2008 high food prices and uh, a lot of disruptions in the world. 100 million people uh, became impoverished in 2008. In 2010, we had another spike uh, in food prices. 44 million more people went uh, into uh, poverty. So for me, uh, despite the stabilization of the food prices, uh, I still think a food uh, security issue uh, in the short term, in the medium term, is going to be a uh, number one uh, big challenge. And including in that uh, is also the issue of energy security and water, uh, because it is related uh, to the food security issue. Uh, and we should not wait till the next spike before uh, we do uh, act. Because, uh, you know, for Indonesia, 10% increase in the price of rice without you doing uh, any, without doing anything in terms of uh, any subsidized program or income increases leads to 1% increase in poverty. Uh, so the problem is real. It's an economic problem. It's a social problem. And then it leads into political uh, problems. So for me, uh, that's uh, what keeps me awake at night. Prime Minister. You yes. Global. Yeah, I agree with some of my colleagues that uh, really the issue of uh, ecological problem is uh, uh, one of the key issue, and uh, this issue is uh, related to small or big countries, regardless to the size and development. And uh, in case of Mongolia, I think we have uh, issues of uh, serious uh, uh, deforest uh, deforestation, degradation issue, and water issue. So these are the key issues we need uh, to have a uh, uh, serious uh, uh, look at that. And uh, of course, the economic issues are important again, especially for the small countries and the economic disparity. And this would be the issues for us, the key issues, Thank you. ecological and economic. <laughs> my, my Japanese is non-existent, uh, see. <laughs> Please. May I speak a little bit longer? Yeah. My concern, not only my concern, but also Japanese people's concern, number one is natural disaster, of course. <laughs> so I would like to talk about uh, regional co cooperation in response to the natural disaster that struck Japan on May 11 this year. First of all, <coughs> however, on behalf of the Japanese business community, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to everyone around the world who supported us very much at that time. We received an enormous amount of assistance, including medical, rescue teams, donations, emergency goods, and rescue equipment. Natural disasters are a global risk that can occur anywhere and pose one of the greatest uh, <clears throat> threats to any country's uh, economic base. That may explain why we have seen recent advances 
in regional cooperation in disaster prevention and also uh, recovery. The Great East Japan earthquake is another opportunity to accelerate such a cooperation. From a disaster prevention <coughs> perspective, the lessons learned from the earthquake and the tsunami by <coughs> sharing you know, uh, the expertise and, and technologies, we will be able to cooperate much, much more you know, among regions. Regional cooperation in even post-disaster recovery effort is crucial for us. For example, in the aftermath of the disaster, Kedan Ben has drawn up scenarios or blueprints that can go beyond rapid recovery in the devastated area to the creation of a new Japan and is striving to make these plans a reality. May I speak a little bit longer? <laughs> Probably this is also your concern, partly. <clears throat> we are also focusing on the restoration of supply chains, encompassing uh, procurement, manufacturing, sales, and distribution, so that Japan can swiftly restart providing the internationally vital parts and materials it produces and fulfill the trust placed in Japanese brands by overseas customers. As a result of such efforts, 85% of materials manufacturers and 71% of processing plants are confident now that they will have sufficient supplies of raw materials, parts, and components by October this year. Of course, in case of automobile industry, they may be able to recover slightly faster or earlier than October, but it differs from company to company. In case of semiconductor industry, we have been striving greatest effort to recover. And uh, during the recovery uh, process, we have accumulated uh, the, <coughs> a kind of uh, expertise you know, uh, in, by swiftly or rapidly restoring supply chains. So most probably, I think, we will be able to help build stronger supply chains throughout uh, Asia and we will be able to contribute to that by sharing examples of many kinds of practices in order to rapidly revitalize industries affected by the disaster. Strong support, this is very important point, from the global community is essential. Yeah. One of, you know, one of the most severely affected industries is tourism. From the viewpoint of you know, uh, that tourism, since the day of earthquake and the tsunami, the number of visit, uh, tourists visiting Japan has fallen dramatically. In, in case of uh, April, for example, the number, that number fell by 62.5%. This is partly because of a lack of uh, accurate information. But we are trying to provide yeah. timely and accurate information from Japan. And I would like to request your understanding and also your support 
in promoting visits to Japan. So, Japan is safe. So, so all, please do not hesitate to visit Japan. All your next <laughs> visits uh, have to be in uh, your next holidays in Japan. So that's <laughs> what I say. Thank you. <laughs> Dominic. Sure. Well, I think it's, uh, it's a very hard question to think about one thing that would worry me because I think there's going to be a lot more volatility uh, over the next 10 years in the world from a number of different factors. But if I had to pick one, it would be unemployment. And I think we've seen the impact of unemployment, particularly youth unemployment in North <laughs> Africa, even Spain, where it's 42 percent. But it's roughly around 20 percent of that globally. And if you look at structural unemployment, which is going up, it's a worry because that's going to lead to protectionism. And I think we're going to see uh, a sense of some countries turning inward to try and create jobs. And one of the downsides of globalization has been people that get disrupted on that side. So I, I worry about that as a, if you will, a deeper structural level of disruption that could have longer term implications for growth and, and how the, the world moves forward. So we have a whole list, I mean, uh, it's worrisome. We have incompetence of the West, we have food security, we have the ecological degradation, particularly deforestation, water issues, we have the supply chain um, challenge, um, a natural disaster uh, prevention, we have the unemployment issue. Um, if I would add, uh, let's say, one issue which we highlighted in our global uh, risk reports this year. It is uh, the number one risk was the risk of deglobalization, a failure of the global system to cope with the complexity of all the issues we have. And we, uh, I mean, we have here only a partial list of all the issues we are confronted with. Now, if we look at the global issues, and if you look at all those which have been mentioned, any concrete proposal, what should be done? What should be the response? Who would like to, to take up one of those issues? Well, Klaus, I, I would say I, I would pick up on your, your last point that the thing that concerns me the most is that even though we're in the human development business, um, education, financial stability, health, healthy lifestyles, that's driven by economic prosperity. And globalization of the economy is creating more and more opportunity for people. But my concern is that we don't have the mechanisms either in the economy, in public sector policy making, or in civil society to really understand the cause and effect within what creates growth and what creates inclusive growth. And our decision making processes are still too national in origin um, in terms of creating uh, goals, multi-sector goals across region, regions, for instance. If you were to look at Asia, we need more and more institutions that would set goals for economic policy, for political policy, and for human development, and then have monitoring. We have great forums like the World Economic Forum, we have Economic Forum, but we don't have multi-sector forum. And I think there's an opportunity to create that regionally around the world. Prime Minister, 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 you want to react, I see. Uh, yes, uh, let me focus on the food security issue, so link what uh, keeps me awake at night with what should be done uh, globally. Uh, obviously, this is the number one uh, item, one of the number one items in the G20 agenda, in the APEC agenda, in the ASEAN uh, and East Asia agenda. Uh, so how do we prevent uh, what, what happened in 2008 and well, it, didn't, it did also happen in 2010, you know, export restrictions and panic buying, which caused uh, not just the price to go up, but to fluctuate widely. And this is uh, one of the concerns uh, that came up uh, in the discussions. But as it turns out, when you talk about food security, it's not just a trade policy issue or even just an agriculture policy issue. You have to ad address it comprehensively. Uh, so there are a couple of elements in the, both in the global as well as regional, possible regional responses that needs to happen. Uh, one is uh, stocks, to ensure sufficient domestic stocks so that you don't go into panic buying. Uh, and uh, having some kind of reserve uh, stocks. This is something we're discussing in Asia, rice reserves for instance, that you can draw on uh, to stabilize uh, prices. 
Uh, second, uh, well-informed uh, policy, <laughs> whether it's trade or fiscal, that doesn't lead uh, to uh, panic buying or, or hoarding, if you like, which tends to sharpen the fluctuation. Something which is already going up uh, tends to get uh, sharpened. So some kind of agreement uh, on, on what to do with uh, the trade and uh, fiscal policy issues, even uh, subsidizing and suppressing price uh, increases. Uh, that's also something uh, which, is, which also needs to be discussed. Third, transparency of information on stocks of uh, stocks in your country, production, consumption, uh, exports, and imports. Uh, this is uh, one of the G20 initiatives to create a better database uh, so that you, know, you don't go into panic because speculators, uh, in the asymmetry of information, uh, this is what pushes prices up. Uh, fourth, uh, increasing productivity and uh, production, R&D uh, and technology. In, in the face of climate change. I think what we're seeing is the effects of climate change, which has led to uh, sharp uh, fluctuations in food production. Uh, this is both a short-term as well as a medium-term challenge. And I think, uh, finally, is uh, really in, in my area, which is, you know, what do we do about, you know, globally speaking, the, the world trading system uh, and the Doha negotiations, if we could have gotten the agriculture package in that Doha round, that would have done so much uh, to put uh, world prices uh, remove the distortions in agriculture prices, which has been depressing investment uh, and uh, production in agriculture. But unfortunately, uh, uh, the Doha round, as we know, is, is uh, not uh, at the moment uh, looking very optimistic. But at least if we could get some components of that package which uh, addresses food security issues, that I think would also be a, a global response, a, a responsible <laughs> global response. You left out one uh, controversial policy measure, uh, which is export restrictions. Did you do it purposely or...? Um... Yeah, export restrictions, uh, we discussed this in, in many forums, and I think at the end of the day, uh, if countries want to ensure that their population have enough food, you know, is that right or wrong? It becomes a very dilemmatic uh, question. Uh, so in the end, I think the answer is twofold. One is you, there must be better uh, sharing of information, and okay, if you're going to do something, you don't sort of announce it and without any warning. There has to be some uh, sharing of information and, uh, if you like, uh, even advanced uh, warning of, of, of this. But the only answer to uh, countries not doing export restrictions is actually food reserves. You know, they wouldn't do export restrictions if they knew that there were these reserves out mm -hmm. there that they could draw on, or other countries uh, can also uh, draw on. That would reduce at least the spikes in the speculation. It might not remove the price increase, but it would uh, smoothen yeah. uh, the fluctuations. Any other concrete proposal related to the concerns expressed? Kishan? Yeah, I, I, actually I want to build on what Brian said, what Dominic said, and what you just said about deglobalization. The, the, what we need to do is all our challenges are clearly global, right? Climate change, food security, uh, economic crisis, and all our responses are national. And that's a fundamentally illogical thing. And it shows basically that if I may put it again very bluntly, the minds of the leaders, leading uh, leaders of the world are political antiques today. They see all the problems through purely national perspective and don't realize that we live in a small interconnected world. And that's why if you were asking for the perfect historical moment for the World Economic Forum to fulfill its role of committed to creating the state of the world, this is the moment to teach the world that we have to come together and work together as one world to, to, to accept the logic of one world and then we'll begin to solve these problems. And that's how you're going to get an answer to the Doha round. Because if you keep on focusing on your national interests, you'll never get a solution to the Doha round. But if you realize we are in the same boat, you have to work together, that's how you get the Doha round. So that's what we have to do now. But uh, Kisho, I, I may challenge a little bit, and I come back to your first, the incompetence of the West. Um, you have a situation where you have to balance out. I mean, we are now uh, in a situation where we have global problems, but national solutions. And politicians are not, let's say, compensated by additional votes, 
looking after global problems, they have to look after national problems. And so the concern of President Obama is probably how to solve the unemployment problem in the US and so on and so on. Um, the Asian countries have, if you take it from a political structural point of view, a, the possibility of a longer term perspective in general. Look at your own country. Um, so how do we solve this issue of let's say national interests, national elections on the one hand and global issues. Prime Minister, do you want to enlighten us? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think um, this is a interesting really because for the politicians, as you rightly mentioned, there is a national interest and of course the, uh, the issue, global issues. And these days uh, those issues are really interconnected uh, 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 to many extent and uh, I think to combat the, uh, for instance on ecological uh, issues for, there are many um, initiatives already and uh, green initiatives and uh, joint uh, the global efforts and the, the policy documents are in place but uh, I think we need to increase um, the public awareness of the problems first yeah. on a national level and on an international level. And with that uh, purpose, for instance, because the ecological issue is a key, a very big issue for Mongolia, at least as uh, there's almost 70% of the, our land is uh, un, um, under desertification and the water issue is there and deforestation, we decided to uh, increase the public awareness of the local community. And we have, uh, uh, we had uh, our cabinet meeting in the Gobi Desert, not in a capital city, in, right in the Gobi Desert, where, where, where is the heaviest part of the desertification. And we told to, to the people, locally first, and of course to, the, to attract the international attention, so that this is the issue. So I think mass media, public awareness, and these issues to be combined with the, the joint efforts which we are trying to do globally, I think. Let me come back to the uh, question of unemployment which you uh, mentioned, Dominic, and I address myself to the two business leaders here. We speak very much about jobless growth and it seems to be that also looking at overcapacities in many areas uh, of, industri of industries, we are in a situation where productivity outpaces now uh, the demand for, for labor. What can we do about it? I mean, uh, what, what is the possibility? Let me ask you second, and let me first you as a, as a business leader who is under pressure to rationalize continuously. How do you still create jobs even if your um, revenues grow? <clears throat> to improve unemployment, <clears throat> We have no selection except for growing economy itself or from the viewpoint of enterprise to grow our business in global, in global market. However, we are facing many new you know, paradigm issues like uh, <coughs> environmental issue versus economic growth. In the 20th century, we did not pay any attention to this you know, conflict. Mm -hmm. But without solving this issue, we cannot survive in the 21st century. So, in order to grow our business, we are willingly forced to create new innovations in the new area. Without, you know, <clears throat> creating innovations in different kinds of new areas, we will not be able to grow ourselves and naturally, accordingly, we will not be able to contribute to the increase of employment. This is a crucial issue for us. So it needs completely new business models. We, we mm -hmm. talk about uh, sustainability, green economy, the Prime Minister mentioned it, uh, Dominic. 
how would you address the issue? Maybe just to build on, on what was said from Japan, I, I would say, um, first of all, that we've actually found in looking at about five countries that where you've now got business leaders it's, uh, and government leaders working together to try and deal with this issue, much very much in the World Economic Forum spirit of, of business and society, there are actually a chunk of jobs that are not filled because the skills aren't there. So one of the really worrying issues is that there's, we have structural unemployment at the same time we have demand for skills that aren't actually there. And so I think one, and that's, it's, it's bigger than you think. It could be 20% in some of the places of that amount. And that's where I think we can learn from places like Singapore with the polytechnics and the roles. It isn't about building more universities. It's mm -hmm. actually more about polytechnics, radiologists mm -hmm. and, and, and nurses and so forth, as opposed to uh, people with, with uh, general university backgrounds. The second point, though, building on this growth and innovation side, is are there ways to also make it easier to start up businesses? A lot of the jobs are actually in uh, small, medium-sized enterprises. And here I would actually look to China. You know, if you go into the mayor of Beijing's office, you'll see on his wall a chart that says the number of days it takes to start a business from scratch is 36 days in Beijing, it's 35 days in Shanghai, and it's six days in Singapore. We don't know what the days are in the US, or we don't know what the days are in Canada, but that's a focus, and so the push is, how can we make it easier for people, entrepreneurs, to be able to build up? And I think there's more that can be done on that side. So I think the, the I actually believe the innovation can be there, but there's things that are getting in the way on regulations and barriers mm -hmm. that can help, and skills that are not uh, in, in place. Concrete proposals. Let me, let me, amongst the global challenges, let me just raise one issue, which is the empowerment of young people. And to a certain extent also the dissatisfaction, the impatience of young people, as we have seen not only in Tunisia and uh, in Egypt, but in Spain. And I have to say, even in a prosperous city, uh, probably one of the most prosperous cities in the world in Geneva, where I am coming from. You have now a camp um, of dissatisfied uh, young, young people. Um, it has been mentioned also in the Asian context that this could happen. Anybody who would like to comment rapidly on how the, uh, the empowerment which we have seen with those young people who have new ways to express their dissatisfaction will have an impact on the world. Dominic? One comment, which is, I think the role that technology and media is playing is actually amplifying that. So if you even think in China about the, the strikes that were held last year, you know, you had m migrant workers that actually were able to afford, afford f cell phones for the first time, who were able to organize themselves on their two-hour bus rides into work and outside of work, and that hadn't been done before. And so I think that that concern, concerns like that maybe have been around for a while, but now the ability to connect up very quickly with quite a large number of people virtually uh, gives more power, if you will. And so I think that's only going to be on the, on the increase with the way that technology is working today. And, and I, would, I would boil it down to two things, uh, access and opportunity. You know, President Obama, the new regime in Egypt, uh, the leadership in Indonesia have the same issues, and that's job creation, opportunity creation, and policy has to go across country and has to be long-term and about how do you give young people access to opportunity? What's, what's your water policy? What's the power policy? What's education policy? And if you look at what happens in the U.S., Two million of those jobs go unfilled because there isn't skilled labor for it. Mm -hmm. Business leaders make one set of decisions in terms of where they're going to take those jobs. National political leadership makes another set of decisions, and young people feel abandoned by each. And so long-term uh, kind of human development as well as economic de development policymaking and giving young people access to, to that opportunity to those decisions. They're, they're going to take it whether we give it to them or not. So you come back to another issue of uh, global governance. You have, in some way, a phenomenon where the power moves from the center, from the traditional middle class, to the young people 
who are empowered right. and who want to have change, but it moves also in an aging society from the middle to the older people yeah. who resist change. <laughs> and uh, how, how do you handle it? Uh, Kishore, any idea? No, I think, I think the, or, the, big, or, the big challenge here is that with the world changing so fast, I think governments are having great difficulty adjusting to the changes. And let me give you, surprisingly, the example of Singapore, which has been by far the most politically stable state in Southeast Asia, probably one of the most politically stable states in the world. And they had elections on uh, May 7th, and the government was completely surprised. I mean, a few ministers lost their seats. And it was very clear that even in Singapore, uh, in a government that had delivered the economic goods for so long, it had lost touch with what the young people were asking for. So what the lesson, the big lesson we're going to learn from all this is that governments all over the world, in both the developed and the developing worlds, have to become more responsive, have to be, become aware of what's being said in the new media, because if you ignore what's happening in the new media, then you get into trouble. Minister? Uh, just uh, to add my uh, thoughts on that, I think it goes beyond just uh, identifying the skills that are needed. I think we also have to focus on self-employment, entrepreneurship, uh, and the role of technology in that is actually a very powerful. Uh, the role of like mobile banking or uh, the, the way uh, we have seen in, in our own country, how uh, the ability to connect on the internet has, made, has opened up uh, business opportunities, even for uh, very, very micro uh, enterprises, and you know how to combine that uh, with the access to financing uh, and empowering uh, them to become self-employed and entrepreneurs, including women. I think uh, we have to uh, make sure that uh, women are included uh, in, in, in the picture of uh, job creation, self-employment, entrepreneurship, SMEs, micro enterprises. Uh, this, I think, will uh, hopefully uh, be able to absorb uh, the uh, more educated youth uh, uh, that are unemployed now. Let me turn now our attention to more to the regional issues. Of course, regional and global issues are interrelated. But when we look at, uh, or let me ask the question in the following way. What do you consider to be the biggest regional challenge? We speak about East Asia. Who would like to start? Kishore? Yeah, maybe, maybe it's time to switch the discussion from geoeconomics to geopolitics. <laughs> and, you know, most people are unaware that what we are experiencing in Southeast Asia is something close to a geopolitical miracle. It's, it's a very unusual development where the world's greatest emerging power, China, so far, is emerging peacefully. Now that's very unusual, you know. History teaches us that when new great powers emerge, there'll be conflict, turbulence, and so on and so forth. I think one lesson East Asia should learn from the events of the last 12 to 18 months is don't take this for granted. Right, you saw an explosion over the fishing boat with Japan. You saw some problems in the North Korean Peninsula. You've seen some problems in the South China Sea. And so the question is, how do we keep this geopolitical miracle going? And one reason why we've had this geopolitical miracle is because the Chinese government has been able to restrain its own population from sort of strong surges of nationalism. And I think this is why the states dealing with China now have to learn to be equally restrained in managing China. Because if you, if, if, you, if you don't, if you touch the wrong fuse in China and you get an explosive nationalist anger in China, you will no longer have this geopolitical miracle that we deal with. So I think we have to focus very seriously on how we keep this geopolitical miracle going in this region. But this geopolitical miracle depends also on continuous strong growth of the Chinese economy. That's right. Would you agree? Yes, absolutely. And, and, that's, why, and that's why it's interesting. The Chinese have also realized that the, they cannot rely on economic growth from America and Europe. And as you know, they're shifting more to domestic <coughs> consumption. And I hope that they succeed in that because, frankly, 
the legitimacy of the present government does rest on consistent economic growth. Any, please. Since uh, <clears throat> Asian market is of paramount importance to Japan as well, <clears throat> I would like to comment on the issue of global imbalances. In order to achieve uh, <clears throat> sustainable growth, Asia needs <clears throat> to break away from its dependence on exposed to Europe and America and shift to a more balanced <clears throat> economic structure underpinned by internal demand from Asia itself. An effective first step to, toward expanding intra-regional demand is the promotion of regional economic integration, I think. Prime Minister? But, but yeah, you know, yeah, uh, sorry. <clears throat> but, it is uh, very important to this end <clears throat> to set up soft or institutional infrastructure <coughs> by reducing tariffs and easing or abolishing uh, <coughs> regulations and to build hard or physical infrastructure in the Asian region <coughs> and here with to facilitate the distribution of course, uh, uh, <clears throat> it may be also important uh, for each country to, you know, <clears throat> improve uh, its people's quality of life by expanding uh, the domestic consumption. For example, enhancing uh, social security systems mm -hmm. could provide initiatives for middle our uh, income earners, you know, to divert income from savings to consumption. And also, another example is to provide uh, more fulfilling national education and vocational training. training. And I think uh, this will bring more people into the middle income bracket. Any yeah. Prime Minister? So, yes, I think uh, the global issues uh, are uh, very much linked with the regional also risks and problems. And here I think uh, economic issues are also uh, key issues here. Uh, risks at the commodity supply, for instance. Rare earth between J Japan and China. Mm -hmm. This is an issue. Uh, we, we could, and uh, Mongolia could become as an alternative for this certain case and the uh, oil issue, oil disruption supply. For instance, in Mongolia's case, we are um, just uh, fully dependent on one supply, and uh, the countries are also, uh, for instance, Libyan case, and many other cases said uh, that oil issue is a, uh, and coal. Coal is in Mongolia is now also, could be one of the players for the market, and uh, the flood and uh, early rain and those issues have become a, also a regional issue and a, a problem for supply of the coal. In other words, the energy um, risk is an issue for the region. And uh, there is a growing demand from, uh, for energy from, as, from China and other uh, countries in the region and the uh, forthcoming shortage of energy. And again, uh, as Minister earlier mentioned, food uh, shortage and food supply issue is, uh, again, I think, the regional issue. With the com uh, economic issues, I think there is a, I agree with Dr. Mah Mahubani that the political uh, risks and issues are, again, very much so related with the regional problems. And in the region where Mongolia is located, for instance, Central Asia, issue in Afghanistan, and uh, the motions in Kyrgyzstan, and uh, of course the, the, the North Korea issue where we would like to also as a part of the region to bring our uh, contribution uh, to, to these issues and South uh, China Sea issues so that I think the political issues are again very important factors for the regional risk assessment. Minister Arland. Yeah, as you know last year in 2010 when you were reviewing what uh, were the global risks 
that were <coughs> keeping everybody awake at the, <laughs> of your members. Uh, number two was man managing the rise of China. Yeah. So uh, I think I would just add to what Kishore was saying earlier. I think the fact uh, how to manage the rise of China is still going to be an important issue within East Asia. And I think East Asia, whatever happens or doesn't happen in East Asia, we know now uh, in the global economic recovery process, affects globally the economic recovery. 60% uh, of the world population is going to be here, so whatever we do or don't do on food security will affect the world, uh, sim similarly with energy and uh, resources use. Uh, not, not to mention ensuring peace and stability so that the economic integration and economic growth continues. So what we need to do is obviously uh, what we do in the region. Uh, now we have to recognize that also has an impact globally. Uh, it's not just about us and uh, our own region. So our responsibility and our role uh, in the global community of nations, which is the theme of Indonesia's chairmanship of ASEAN this year. So how do we strengthen ASEAN economic, uh, ASEAN cooperation in general, as well as East Asia cooperation to manage the sparks, if there are sparks uh, in the geopolitical sense, which I agree totally with Kishore, we should never take it for granted. There are sparks here and there. How do we manage it uh, so we can uh, uh, ensure uh, peace and stability in the region to ensure the economic growth, economic integration uh, takes place? And then on the economic integration, uh, that, that would be my final point. Uh, obviously, what we do or don't do in the region in terms of uh, economic integration, hope, hopefully it's open uh, economic integration, not closed block. Because there is, you know, the fear of that tendency is something we have to avoid. We have to show the way. Uh, in the absence of, of uh, a stronger uh, multilateral deal, then the region also needs to play a role uh, to make sure that what we do in the region is not just for us, but it's, it's really to contribute globally. Dominic? Just a couple of things, maybe building on what people are saying. I think that it's going to be so important, this conversion from export-driven, investment-driven growth, particularly in China but other countries, mm -hmm. to a more consumption-driven. And it's in all of our global interest that that happen quickly and smoothly, or we're going to have problems with growth. And I would put that in juxtaposition with underlying tensions. I mean, I, I would love to see the numbers on trust. How much do Japan, the average middle-class Japanese trust the Chinese versus the Indian? I'm just, it's not a very popular thing to say, but the, this underlying trust is vital because if you stop getting growth, and then you, you, it's nice to go outside and have nationalism and so forth. And I think there's underlying tensions that are there. And so I would just echo what's being said here to double down on the social, social capital. How do we get much deeper understandings of the different societies there? Because that will be the, I think, the, the sort of the spark that can, that can blow things if we don't have a nice shift from investment export driven to consumption driven. And, and if I could, let me, let me build on that because I think for the region it's important not to stay dependent militarily or economically to the West, on the West, but this idea of uh, social investment across the region. That it's interesting to watch how Korea is increasingly investing in social issues in Southeast Asia. And if you look at the response to earthquake and tsunami in Japan, the response privately has mostly been regional, mm -hmm. not from the West. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be critically important going forward that, uh, you know, the, the consumption-based regional economy is important, but to Dominic's point, so is the exchange of social capital and social support within the region, mm -hmm. because that, that, that's the third leg that builds a, a sustainable uh, regional society. Kishore. Could we summarize the discussion in the following ways that we say the West, uh, you, you um, made your first critical remark, has a relatively high political homogeneity, but big economic issues. And Asia has big economic potential, but the danger of political disruptions and political tensions. Yes, I mean, you're right, but just to balance that, I mean, you know, when, when wars do not happen, when tensions do not rise, you can just say it's accidental, or you can also say it's a result of some fundamental forces at play. And I can tell you that one of the things I've learned about East Asia, and this may be cultural, by the way, that there is a culture of what I call pragmatism and prudence when it comes to problem solving. So you may have a big fight, 
between China and Japan over the fishing boat incident. And three months later, somehow, the Prime Minister of Japan meets the Prime Minister of China in some meeting, G20 meeting, and so on and so forth, and tries to calm the waters. Similarly, you've had problems on South China Sea, things flare up, and then they meet and try to come in. So I would say that the, the, if you can keep, if, we, if by the way, if, huh? if you can keep this culture of pragmatism and prudence going, then we will be able to manage the political challenges that you identified so correctly. Let me, before we go to a more uh, personal question, uh, let me just come up with one final question related to global and regional issues. It's the role of the G20. I mean, Indonesia is a member of the G20. Japan is a member of the G20. Um, how much does the G20 have the legitimacy and the capability in the present global situation to bring solutions to all the issues which were mentioned here. I see only embarrassed faces here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, let me take a, uh, try to answer uh, your very uh, difficult and I guess provocative question. I think uh, it, it is still uh, the best thing we have out there in terms of, if you like, uh, the steering committee of the world uh, economy. Uh, at the moment, uh, and there are things that can be achieved uh, within the G20 framework, although it's not the only uh, mechanism. And what needs to happen is obviously to ensure uh, that there is uh, representation, enough representation in the room, say for instance Indonesia in there, we are not just representing Indonesia, we're also representing ASEAN and so on. Uh, and ASEAN is also sitting uh, there uh, in, on its own right. Uh, and second, how do you take what, what leaders agree in G20 uh, and make sure that there is the reality check with the business sector as well as other stakeholders? I think World Economic Forum has participated in what they call the B20. I think that's still, that's an important input. And of course, implementation. Impl a lot of the implementation has to happen in, in the IMF, uh, in the World Bank, in the WTO, uh, as well as regional and national uh, commitments. And it seems to me uh, one of the big issues that uh, will be discussed in November, uh, amongst others, uh, apart from the macro issue, uh, one of the important macro issues in there which relates to what we were talking about earlier about energy security is the removal of fuel subsidies. That's been on the G20 agenda. Uh, this needs to be uh, addressed. Second, uh, of course, on financial sector architecture and correcting imbalances, that still is a, a key issue given uh, the drift in the West, as <laughs> Kishore put it. I think we're not over the Eurozone crisis. We are not over uh, the issue in the US with their, with their debt cap and whether they're gonna get it or not. So the uncertainty in the world economic recovery is still going to be a big issue. The third issue is food security, which, which has, uh, uh, interestingly enough, it started out as let's get at the commodity uh, right. speculators. Now it's become a much wider agenda as it should be. And if we can get, uh, I think, uh, output out of that, which is implement, then uh, taken to uh, both global action, regional action, and national action, I think this, this hopefully uh, will provide the usefulness uh, of G20. And I think the, the, the question out there, for the finance and macro uh, follow-up, you have IMF and you have the G20 finance ministers as a process. You don't have a similar follow-up process for the other issues, so how, how do you get at that? Oh, just maybe one final one. I forgot I'm a trade minister after all those <laughs> thinking. What you were saying earlier, uh, uh, facing the rise of protectionism, you know, uh, in, the, in, in, in the lack of progress of Doha, this is again going to be so important and, and how, how are we going to take that uh, issue forward and how, what G20 leaders are going to say about that. We spoke about uh, political issues and uh, global issues, regional issues. But let me ask you now a very personal question. Should you wake up in the night, I mean, and really be, be worried about societal developments? I mean, is the global society going into the right direction? There are fundamental changes that are uh, happening now. Um, what, what is worrying you? We, we touched upon one, which is the empowerment of youth, 
but other other such um, disruptions which are worrisome or which may be great opportunities. Brian, do you want to start? Okay. That's prime, or Prime Minister? Okay. Yeah, I think uh, uh, those, again, those issues are very much uh, related. Uh, and uh, I th uh, personally, I think uh, uh, the issue, uh, one of the key issues is uh, the growing social disparity. Uh, Mongolia is uh, one of, one of the, uh, the country which is really blessed with the uh, abundant mineral resources. And uh, we think that uh, the issue that we talk about uh, Dutch disease and the uh, resource curse and uh, many, many other uh, the challenges we have. And we would like to make it uh, to solve uh, to, to the benefit of the citizens and people of the Mongolia to provide an equal opportunity. And uh, we have introduced, uh, we, did, we have learned from others good experiences. We say that we don't need to reinvent the wheel in many uh, cases, and uh, we learn from uh, Norwegian good experience and uh, Chilean experience and Alaskan fund issue. So we have introduced the stability, stability fund we got in place. We got the human development fund or the government of Mongolia has introduced, we got the investment uh, development bank concept so that we channel all this uh, wealth to the, to the benefit of the people, to the benefit of the, uh, uh, solving the issues of disparities also provi by providing equal opportunities. So I think that's the, the uh, growing social disparities, uh, one of the key issues that countries need to uh, look at on a national level and learn from uh, others and work together internationally. You could turn it around and say uh, disparity, but what we need uh, if we want to survive as a society is much more social inclusion. Uh, Brian, you are particularly in this area. What, what, where is you? Well, let me very quickly first say that um, both at the highest level and then maybe the most local level, what worries me. The relevance of the G20 to me, close to your earlier question, is almost completely driven by the willingness of the original G7 to understand their changing role in the world. And it seems to me like there are multiple agendas within the G20, and I find it difficult, therefore, to have a G20 agenda. Um, side meetings, G7 meetings, the G8 meetings, and then the G20 meetings. So that being said, my experience is, and we've talked a lot about global issues and national issues, um, inclusion starts at a very local level. Are we sustainable at a village level, at a prefecture level, uh, at a state level, and what are we doing to build the infrastructure within local communities? Because in, what's interesting to me, when we go back to the social media, young people aren't just connecting with themselves within country, they're connecting with each other across borders. And so social and economic inclusion is going, we are going to have to address um, at a very local level where people are living and the impact not just within country but across country. And I do think that, I made the point earlier, that the policy of the U.S. Congress or the U.S. President uh, can only go so far. He and they have to think outside of country if they're going to, if they're going to be successful with, within their own country. And I think it therefore takes legislative uh, and, and business incentive around access to education, to power, to water. At the, at the Vietnam, at the, the forum on East Asian Vietnam, there was, I was on a panel at the time with the head of the Philippines Water Authority. And he told the story of how he was running water pipe through very poor neighborhoods in Manila to get to industrial parks, commercial development, and he was dealing with his problem of everyone was stealing his water as it went through those neighborhoods. And he finally went into those neighborhoods and asked why people were stealing his water, and they just wanted access. They just wanted access to water and opportunity, and as soon as they changed their policy to start creating access into those poorer neighborhoods, his efficiency went up dramatically, his profitability went up, and he still got water to the industrial, to the industrial park. It's that, it's that level of micro-inclusion that then builds up to national policy and good global decision making that I think sometimes we lose sight of. And it, people don't want that much. They just want that kind of access. 
That's a good response to the issue raised, but I want to know your personal worry in addition. Um, my I, personal worry is that people in the world are, in terms of their thinking, their desire, their interaction, have gone way beyond our institutions. That our institutions are lagging where people are. And I mean that in terms of government, business, and NGOs. That technology's been part of it, but I think, I think our institutions have to, I'll, even including mine, have to be, have start operating much differently, much more um, flexibly, um, much more inclusively, because I think the people have gotten beyond us, and it worries me. And it worries me from an economic perspective, and it worries me socially. So the incapability of our systems to cope with the complexity and with the new demands. I, I think our systems always lag uh, kind of social need and social demand and economic demand, but I think the cycles in the world, economic, social, political cycles, are so much faster today that we, we, we're lagging so much that we, we run the risk of big economic disruption, big social disruption. Kishan? No, actually, my, I share Brian's worry significantly. In fact, what, what wakes me up at night uh, is the fear of not finishing my next book, <laughs> <laughs> which, by the way, is on a subject that, that only you mentioned, by the way. You only, use it, you only use the two words, global governance, and it's a very, very boring term. Nobody wants to address it, but we live in a world where the demand for global governance, as demonstrated by what Brian just said, is growing exponentially but the supply is diminishing because, as you mentioned, leaders are preoccupied with national challenges and not paying attention to global. So, so this disparity between supply of global governance and demand is, I think, a major uh, global challenge that we face today. But there is, the good news, by the way, is that there is a silver bullet, you know. You can actually find a way of creating a, a relatively stable world order that carries on the kind of, what I say, relatively miraculous growth we've had the last few decades. And that silver bullet, if I had to put it in four words, is called the rule of law. And if you can create a single rule of law that applies equally to the most powerful countries in the world, as well as to the smallest countries in the world equally, then you solve an incredible number of problems overnight, whether it's Israel, Palestine, none of us have touched upon it, uh, here, whether it's the South China Sea, yeah. whether it's the dispute with Japan over the fishing boat, whether it's the North Korean issue, the rule of law, if we begin to accept a single rule of law for the world, and the time has come basically because you created a single human community across the globe, you now need to create a single rule of law. I think it can be done, and that's what I hope we will can, we'll try to achieve in the next 10 years. What I, what I feel very important is this. Uh, aspect is also to create um, global benchmarks and um, I just want to draw your attention to the competitiveness report which we have published on Indonesia as a benchmark exercise. I, Kisho, I recall about uh, 10 years ago uh, Singapore uh, scored number one in our global competitiveness report and I happened to visit Singapore at that time and I saw the Prime Minister Go Chok Tong and I told him, uh, congratulations Prime Minister, uh, you are number one. He, and he, his reaction was yes, but in education we are only 16 at that time <laughs> or whatever it was. And I have created an interministerial committee to see how we can improve. And that I think the, that what we should do we should always uh, take the best examples and to follow those. But, um, Minister? Yeah, you asked, me, asked us the question about what is your personal uh, yeah. uh, response to what keep, what I suppose it's a personal gripe and a personal uh, regret that this is opportunity lost, uh, that we could, if we did this, uh, we could really increase growth uh, reduce uh, poverty, in, uh, create jobs, and reduce inequity, which is to unleash the potential of the largest emerging economy in the world of the size of $10 trillion. Uh, do you know uh, what is that 
a, a size of uh, what is that emerging economy? It's women. Yeah. <laughs> it's ten trillion dollars is the amount women spend, uh, and ninety. If you take one dollar uh, income uh, spent by women, ninety percent goes to the household. If you take men spending, only fifty percent goes to the household. And we have all kinds of numbers which show that if, if it's women who are uh, managing the money, it goes to education, it goes to health, it reduces poverty, uh, it increases uh, human skills. Uh, and in the very powerful uh, three years ago session on uh, girl effect, uh, if you provide equal opportunity for education for girls, uh, they go into uh, more gainful employment, they uh, reduce uh, in, uh, un unemployment uh, and poverty. Uh, and another number, uh, if you gender, uh, mainstream uh, gender into uh, policy, such as like community empowerment programs, you, make, you have to involve the, the women in the decision making. Otherwise, you know, I, I had some experience uh, when, before I became minister working in, in Africa on the UN Millennium Development Goals. And if you gave the, the decision to men, for instance, in a, in a village, if you had $100,000, uh, uh, what would you use it for? The men would say, okay, let's have a satellite dish so we can uh, watch football. You give it to the women, say, okay, let's build pipes from the river to the village so we don't have to go every day <coughs> 10 times to get water. You know, so it's, it's this reality. So I would say, let's make sure government policy, uh, business models, uh, provide equal opportunity, uh, for women and equal access because you are going to unleash uh, unbelievable uh, economic growth and at the same time create employment, uh, reduce poverty and reduce uh, inequities. What is, what is your biggest worry at night? Is it your next quarterly statement? Mm -hmm. What is your biggest worry at night? Is it your next quarterly statement? <laughs> <coughs> I have to repeat what I said once again. <laughs> In order for human beings to understand each other, because human being consists of rational part and irrational sentiment. Of course, you can understand each other by reading books, you know, written by many countries, people, but without face-to-face -face communication with each other, it's really difficult to understand deeply. Then, Travel and tourism will be playing the most important role. I don't say so because I'm chairman of Japan Travel and Tourism Association as well. <laughs> but even in my case, if I did not visit many countries, I could not understand your history, your culture, your customs, which are very important you know, for us to understand each other. So, please visit Japan <laughs> once again. <laughs> and please try to support the re Japan's recovery from the disaster. We welcome you with a spirit of traditional Japanese-style hospitality. This is I, my message. I, I can tell you, um, <laughs> you know, I visited your country four, five weeks ago. To, to show my solidarity, and you never have been received better in Japan as you are now. Uh, Dominic? Yeah, I, the, the thing I worry the most about is actually short-termism versus long-termism. You're actually, your point about quarterly earnings. Yeah. And it, to me, it's another example of how governance is not match fit. We, it, we've talked about national governance for global issues. I think that with technology and the media cycles, there's a sense to be very, very short term. The media cycle now is three times a day. It used to be 10 years ago, three times a year. And, and for governments, it's very difficult to, for elected governments to be able to think about dealing with long term issues like education or even women empowerment, which I completely agree with. These are not things that you can do in your election cycle. If you're a, if you're a business, and you're trying to build yeah. new businesses that typically take seven to eight years to do it. You, it's difficult to do that if you're being measured in a short-term manner. So I, that's something that worries me because some of these big issues and risks we have are long-term, but we have short-term biases in terms of how we deal with them, which will cause us challenge. Let me not be presumptuous and try to summarize, but maybe at the end I bring in a, a, a personal note 
Um, I have to say what worries me is, is how uh, the strains on business leaders and political leaders to cope with the situation, the complexity of the situation. And I think when, when what keeps you, what wakes you up at night, I, I would say uh, nearly a, a, from my own experience, it's the hostess which says, uh, so we are landing in 15 minutes. Um, b because the world has become so complex. But if I would add a very personal note, um, um, one matter I'm very uh, preoccupied with, I think we are going through a second um, uh, revolution which cannot be compared with the industrial revolution. When we talk about the internet, we usually talk about the second or third industrial revolution. I think it's a revolution which is very similar to the, when we, um, when the world or humanity became domesticated, which means we suddenly becoming um, dwellers instead of hunters, we develop tools. And until now, technological progress was mainly to, uh, to create tools to do better, uh, to increase what we are doing, to, to increase productivity. But if we look at the internet, the internet is more, it's a tool, but it's more than a tool. It has become parts of our own DNA as a government, as a business, as an individual, which means in some way we are uh, outsourcing parts of ourselves. Um, this raises a whole uh, series of issues, a uh, question of um, how much do we own ourselves? Um, I mean, how much is Google owning us now, or, or Facebook? Or if you look at governments, uh, WikiLeaks, um, and so on and so on. So we are not anymore in control of everything. Uh, so it's a part of our DNA which is now public. And this offers a great opportunity for mankind because we could say one part of, the, of our DNA we could really share uh, globally. And we, we could have the beginning of a new global civilization based on, on this major uh, uh, revolution which is happening. But of course, it uh, creates also a number of issues uh, which we have to uh, resolve and for which uh, Kishore we have to take we have to create the necessary legal uh, framework how to handle those issues. I would like to thank the panelists on behalf of the audience. I think it was a very lively discussion. We touched most of the important issues. Uh, some of those we will follow up in the um, um, discussions over the next uh, 36 hours. So. Thank you very much for having been such active, lively contributors.